Hi, and welcome back to the second part of our nuclear physics discussion. So we're going to talk about nuclear decay and nuclear reactions. We are going to focus on two of this many nuclear decay reactions. One's called the alpha reaction, or alpha decay, and the other is called the beta reaction, or beta decay. Now, an alpha reaction is when a nucleus spontaneously emits what's known as an alpha particle. An alpha particle, which you will see written this way because that's a Greek alpha, consists of a helium nucleus, a helium-4 nucleus to be precise. So that's a 2-4. Recalling, 2 stands for 2 protons, and 4 means 4 total nucleons. In other words, 4 minus 2 is 2 neutrons. 2 protons, 2 neutrons. That's our particle. In that process of emitting this and losing 2 protons and losing 2 neutrons, we are going to transform into an entirely different element. A generic example of that would be if I had atom A with X protons and Y total number of nucleons decays by the alpha process, its product is a new element that has two fewer protons and four fewer total nucleons. This brings up the point of balancing nuclear equations. And again, I assume all of this is review for you guys. The left-hand side and the right-hand side have to have the same number of particles, and specifically the same number of, uh, the, of each particle. So the left-hand side has X protons and Y minus X neutrons. On the right-hand side, we have a 2 and an X minus 2. Well, if you add those together, you get X, which balances. Up top, we have four total nucleons in the helium and Y minus four in our other product. And they, again, add together to make Y. So this is the balancing. You will do some practice where you have to fill in the blanks on a decay process. You may be asked to identify the product, or you may be asked to identify the type of decay process. And if you see that your product has two less protons then the reactant, it's a pretty good indication that you might be looking at an alpha decay. Now beta decay, here's your Greek beta symbol, is an electron. And uh, the first question everybody has right away is, what's with the negative one? That's weird. The negative one is there for practical reasons. And I think the best way to illustrate that is do the same process we did for the alpha decay. Now, what you have to understand is this beta process is the transforming of a neutron into a proton. So if I start off with my generic element, A, with X number of protons and Y number of total nucleons, it's gonna turn into an element that has one more proton. But since all we're doing is moving from neutron to proton, the total number of nucleons stays the same. So this particle that's kicked out has to satisfy the same requirements we had up top. In other words, the right-hand side number of protons has to add up to the left-hand side. And I think your algebra would tell you that x plus 1 and negative 1 would add up to x. So this is just a practical thing. And up top, you already have y to the right and y to the left, so that's a 0. Okay. Now, this, this particle is an electron. And uh, you think, well, is that how all electrons are made? Uh, not necessarily. Particle physics is very complicated. We are just skimming the surface. We're like skipping stones across the lake. We're not looking into the lake at all. But you got to start somewhere. This is a good place to start. These two processes uh, occur naturally. The reason for these processes occurring, in general, is because we have an unstable nucleus. The nucleus itself is kind of a miracle in a way. You have so many mutually repulsing protons confined to a small space and you've got this force holding them together. That Remember, that force is governed and uh, in a sense delivered by the neutrons. So if the balance between protons and neutrons is off, nature will correct that. Now, in the case of an alpha, it usually occurs 
because we have too many protons. This nucleus is just too big to be stable. And this, this occurs for all the elements above lead, and for a strange reason, some below that as well. Lead is a very big nucleus, but it's just small enough that it can, can hold together, unless you get a strange isotope of lead, which is out of balance again. So bottom line is an alpha decay will rectify that situation because when you lose a helium nucleus, you're losing two of your protons and it will stabilize that. So in essence, the element that is the product is moved two spaces to the left on the periodic table. Now beta decay happens when the balance is the other way, when there's too many neutrons and which oftentimes is actually the, the product of alpha. An alpha will give you a new nucleus that is um, potentially more stable in the proton side of things, but then might result in having too many neutrons. And so beta decay rectifies that situation. You're actually going up the periodic table or to the right on the periodic table by one element. This is how nature does this. Now, when you get up, say, to something like uh, uranium-238, and this thing starts decaying in order to stabilize, it'll undergo a whole series of alphas and betas in particular uh, sequences until it gets down to something over time that is stable, which is usually down in the lead range. That's nuclear decay. We're next going to talk about nuclear reactions in general. The two special reactions that we're going to look at right now are known as nuclear fission and fusion. Nuclear fission happens when a nuclei is destabilized and splits into two smaller nuclei, usually two smaller nuclei, and often a variety of other particles. It's a messy process. Nuclear fission releases a tremendous amount of energy and is the primary, uh, this, this is the reaction when we have a nuclear power plant. Um, it's also witnessed in uh, nuclear atomic weapons. So this is the essence of fission, is a splitting of the nucleus. Now fusion, on the other hand, is when you take smaller nuclei and create bigger ones. This process occurs primarily in stars. The reason that this is something that occur, occurs mostly in stars is because the process of getting two repulsive particles, like a proton, to come together and fuse is very difficult. Remember, they repel each other. So you have to have these things moving at tremendous speeds with tremendous amounts of kinetic energy in order to get close enough for the nuclear strong force to take over. And therefore, these only occur in nature at extremely high temperatures, something on the order of 10 million Kelvin. Stars shine because of this process. This also gives off energy. This, as a matter of fact, most times gives off even more energy than the fission reactions. This is the joining of particles to create larger nuclei. The same rules apply to these reactions as the decay reactions. The left-hand side of your equation has to balance your right-hand side of equation in terms of total number of protons and nucleons. Prime examples of this would be uh, the, the splitting of, for instance, in fission, the uranium-235 nucleus. This process is started when a uranium-235 nucleus absorbs a neutron. This neutron destabilizes the nucleus. Basically what it does is it, it, it causes just enough disturbance in the nucleus so that the repulsive forces inside the nucleus went out and the nucleus decays. Now, typically it decays into the following products, a krypton nucleus, a barium nucleus, and three neutrons. One of the things that I think is important to see is that this balances. You've got 92 protons on this side and a total between the 36 and 56 of 92 on the right-hand side. Up top, you have 236 total nuclei, right? 235 plus one. And then uh, your 89 plus 144 plus three times one is also 236. 
This is one of many ways this can go down. Well, not, yeah, the, several. There's several ways this can go down. This is probably the most famous. One of the interesting things to note is these three neutrons. Now, if it takes a neutron to make this reaction start, and the product includes three more neutrons, these three neutrons all have the capability of running into another nucleus and causing the same thing to happen. And if you have enough of these nuclei in a small space, you can actually get what's known as a chain reaction. And this chain reaction uh, is an exponential growth in this process, which um, will release a tremendous amount of energy in a small amount of time. It, it should also be noted that one of the other products here on the right-hand side is a gamma ray, which is a photon with a lot of energy. Plus, there's a lot of kinetic energy involved in um, both of these particles. So you, you get a form of radiation energy and kinetic energy of the particles. If, it, if it's a controlled chain reaction, you have a nuclear reactor, say in a power plant. If it's an uncontrolled chain reaction, that would be more like an atomic weapon. The only thing that you'll be asked to do with these is uh, balance equations like this. You will also be asked to do a single problem on your worksheet that requires that you fuse this idea, haha, no pun intended, maybe, maybe not, and your previous ideas of kinetic energy and conservation of momentum. You essentially have a uh, situation where you're going to have a recoil momentum problem because you have this assuming a stationary uranium nucleus, you're going to have particles moving away from each other afterwards that, uh, so you're going from a state of zero momentum to a final state of multiple particles having momentum that should still add up to zeros. But I'll let you explore that on your worksheet. For an example, I'm gonna talk about the fusing of deuterium and tritium. Deuterium is a hydrogen atom that consists of one proton, one neutron, which is not typical, actually. Tritium has two protons, which is extra not normal. Yeah, I made that up. And what happens when these things come together and fuse is you will get a helium nucleus plus a neutron. Again, when this process happens, oh, and not let's not forget, plus, I ran out of room, lots of energy. Again, you have to get these things incredibly close together before this fusion process happens. So you, it takes a tremendous amount of uh, temperature to make that happen. But it does release a lot of energy in the process. And you're forming the element helium. You can imagine one of the reasons that scientists are so interested in creating a fusion reactor is that you're taking the most abundant element in the entire universe, hydrogen, Converting it to helium, which is a inert element, which is not radioactive, and producing energy in the process. Creating usable energy from fission involves creating particles that are highly radioactive and dangerous, and it turns out also that a single fusion reaction releases, releases much more energy than a single fission reaction. To sum this up, we talked about nuclear decay processes, and then nuclear reactions such as fission and fusion, and you will get a chance to practice balancing equations, determining mass defects, and balancing nuclear reactions. Have fun.